For a thousand years, kings and queens of Europe had absolute power. But absolute power corrupts absolutely. Greed, revenge, sex, madness, witchcraft, murder. Every monarch had their royal secrets. Throughout history, kings had the power to pick lovers on a whim. Female royals also enjoyed the same power. But unfortunately for their men, Russian Tsarina Catherine the Great and French Queen Marguerite of Valois both bestowed upon their lovers the kiss of death. Marguerite of Valois was a renowned beauty. She fed a lifelong hunger for passion with countless lovers. Unfortunately for the hapless men in her life, one after the other they met hideous, bloody ends. Known as Queen Margot, Marguerite grew up with three murderous brothers who became kings of France and with a ruthlessly ambitious mother, Queen Catherine de Medici. Margot was to marry and divorce French King Henry IV. She was surrounded by a royal court steeped in intrigue and corruption, and each of her lovers came to an unlucky end. Her later years were haunted by the memory of her many lost loves. In her youth, Margot was of fair complexion, with blue eyes, abundant black tresses, and a provocative figure. Don Juan of Austria was blinded by her beauty when he met her. She looked more like a goddess of heaven than a princess of earth. Her charms were better suited to ruin men than to save them. Her beauty was sent to Damas. The young Margot was torn between religion and politics by her bullying family. It was a time of religious war in France. In 1572, her mother devised a diplomatic scheme for the Catholic Margot to marry Protestant Prince Henry. The reluctant 19-year-old Margot had to be physically forced to the altar for the arranged marriage. She never said, I do, during the ceremony. One of her brothers had to push her at the appropriate moment and the nod of her head was taken as her affirmation of the vows. The marriage was a cynical trap set by Margot's mother to lure the unsuspecting Protestants to Paris. Six days after the wedding, the religious bloodbath of St. Bartholomew's Eve erupted as Catholics turned in hatred against their Protestant enemy. Thousands of Protestants were cut down in the streets and slaughtered in their homes. Margot bravely sheltered her new Protestant husband, who would otherwise have been hacked to pieces by the angry Catholic mob. Despite this, Margot's marriage to Prince Henry was loveless from the start. But Margot and Henry stayed married for political reasons, and although they lived apart, they became close friends and allies for the rest of their lives. Shortly after her wedding, Margot took the first of her many lovers. Boniface de la Molle was a dashing figure, the best dancer at court and an incurable ladies' man. The charming la Molle became hopelessly infatuated with Margot. The love affair didn't last long. A wax effigy was found in his room, and he was accused of plotting to kill Margot's brother, King Charles IX, by witchcraft. Margot's mother, Catherine, ordered him executed. Imprisoned here in the Conciergerie in Paris, La Mole was first horrifically tortured with the boot, a device that crushed every bone in the foot.
Margot's lover was then beheaded and quartered in the Place de Grève. Legend has it he asked the crowd at the scaffold to tell Margot his last thoughts were of her. For her part, Margot made a point of publicly wearing mourning for him. It was said that she herself retrieved her lover's skull so that it could be given a decent burial. Lamol's execution was the beginning of a lifelong pattern of thwarted love for Margot. Time and again she would find herself robbed of happiness. Margot's brother, Charles IX, died soon afterwards, to be succeeded by her next brother, Henry III. He was to brutally bully and rule her life for years. When she took a new lover, Margot's reputation as a loose woman was confirmed. Rumours circulated at court that she had been found in a compromising position with a young noble, Jacques de Harley and it was even said that she had an affair with a Duke d'Alençon, her youngest brother. Angered by the vicious court gossip swirling around his sister, Margot's brother, King Henry, decided to discipline his errant sister. Henry asked Margot to be his hostess at a ball held in the Louvre. At the height of the party, he falsely accused her of having a child by de Harley. The king went on to list all her liaisons in intimate detail and ordered her to deliver the court from her contagious presence. Jacques de Harley prudently decided a relationship with Margot was too dangerous and deserted her. Early the next morning, disgraced and furious, Margot fled Paris into exile. Even as she was making her escape, she was followed and humiliated by a group of men sent by her brother, the king. Margot settled in a fortress in the Auvergne region of France, where she had her own bodyguards and considered herself in a state of war with her brother, Henry III. Margot's jinx in love followed her. she fell seriously ill and was nursed back from the brink of death by the son of the local apothecary. He fell hopelessly in love with her. But one of Margot's bodyguards was desperately in love with her too. In a jealous fit, the bodyguard burst into Margot's bedroom and stabbed his rival to death. Undaunted by this string of tragedies, Margot found another lover. To the annoyance of her brother, she now fell for an army captain. Margot described him as... A touching figure who, in an earlier century, would have inspired the songs of troubadours. Trying to escape Henry's spies, the lovers were betrayed and apprehended by the king's troops. Margot tried to save her lover by hiding him in a chimney, but he was found, and Henry ordered him executed in front of Margot to teach his sister a lesson. Kissing a fragment of one of Margot's blue velvet gowns, the unfortunate young man was strung upside down until his head filled with blood. Still breathing, he was then dropped head first into an open grave and buried alive. Margot was finally released from her royal brother's brutal meddling when he was assassinated in 1589. Margot was at last free from her dangerous and hated brother. Margot's estranged husband now became Henry IV. Middle-aged and still without an heir, Henry needed to secure a dynastic grip on the throne. In order to be able to marry again, he would have to divorce Margot. Margot agreed to the split, but her price was a large annual allowance and a huge settlement. The divorce made Margot a rich woman. 
Now known as the Pearl of France, Margot continued to look for love. Still seeking virility, she democratically chose her lovers from all walks of life. There was a cathedral choir tenor, the son of a local carpenter, a shepherd, a valet de chambre, and even a strolling musician. Margot eventually persuaded King Henry to let her leave the provinces and return to Paris, but she was a parody of her former self. Now in her fifties, Margot still insisted on dressing in the style and fashions of her youth. She had grown very fat and wore a great deal of makeup. She had lost her glossy, abundant dark hair and wore huge blonde wigs, half a foot higher than the current fashion. For a constant supply of hair, blonde footmen were kept at hand to be shorn whenever she needed a new wig. Margot's unlucky affairs continued to cost her hapless lovers their lives. She took two lovers at once, a 20-year-old named Saint-Julien and an 18-year-old called Vermont. They were rivals. Vermont murdered Saint-Julien, shooting him through the head in front of Margot as they were returning from mass. Margot was so incensed, she insisted Vermont be hanged on the spot and offered to donate her garters for the purpose. He was hanged the next day outside her home. Margot was so distressed, she moved to a new home opposite the Louvre, where she lived with her lovers, holding raucous nightly banquets. She became popularly known as Queen Venus. Her ex-husband, King Henry, begged her to stop carousing and act her age. A Jesuit preacher denounced Margot's licentiousness from the pulpit of Notre Dame Cathedral, complaining that her habit of displaying her ample bosom had been adopted by the impressionable young girls of Paris. Stories about her abounded, that she was so obese she couldn't get through doors, that she had emergency wigs under the folds of her huge skirts in case of accidents, that she kept little scented bags under her girdle containing the embalmed hearts of all her dead lovers. Despite a lifetime of dangerous liaisons, Margot outlived her entire family. She ended her days attended by her young lovers and died peacefully just before her 62nd birthday in 1615. Her body was laid to rest in the Cathedral of Saint-Denis. But when the tombs of her mother and father were later transferred to another church, Margot's remains mysteriously disappeared. To this day, they have never been found. Two hundred years later, in Russia, another royal proved to have the kiss of death. But unlike Margot, this monarch loved power as much as she loved her paramours. She was Catherine the Great, Tsarina of all the Russias. The year was 1745 and Catherine was married to Peter III, heir to the Russian throne. Peter was the commander of one of Europe's greatest armies and fought many great battles, all of them in his head. Peter loved to play with his toy soldiers. He drilled and maneuvered regiment upon regiment in every room of his palace at Peterhof, for Peter had the mind of a child. Peter liked to occupy himself with weighty matters, such as the case of the nibbled guardsman. In one incident, Peter caught a large rat, which he believed had eaten some of his toy soldiers. 
The rat was formally court-martialed and summarily executed. Its body left suspended on a toy gallows as a lesson to other rats who might want to attack the royal regiments. Under the circumstances, Catherine's marriage to Peter was not a happy union. Catherine once remarked that... To read the dullest book was a pleasure when Peter walked into the room. The couple's bedroom was not a place for love, but a stage for Peter's toy army. The child, like Peter, neglected his young wife, who remained a virgin for years after their marriage. The weak, unstable Tsar was completely under the control of his aunt, the Empress Elizabeth. And Peter had failed in his main duty, to sire an heir. With no interest in having sex with Catherine, the chance of fulfilling this task was remote. The Empress Elizabeth suggested Catherine take a lover, a man who could provide an heir, but who would be willing to fade into the background after the birth allowing Peter to take the credit. At a masked ball in the autumn of 1753, Catherine met Sergei Salchukov, a dashing young officer in the Imperial Guard. Catherine was still a shy, unhappily married virgin. Sergei was married to a dull lady-in-waiting who knitted sweaters for Catherine's pet poodle. Catherine thought Sergei as handsome as the dawn, and her passion for him blossomed. To avoid the prying eyes of vicious court gossips, Catherine and her lover resorted to secrecy and took great risks to meet. Catherine's sanctuary from her bizarre husband was in her beloved Sergei's arms. But that was about to end. Catherine became pregnant. With that news, Sergei was removed from court, his duty done. When she gave birth to a son, the baby was taken from her and sent to the Empress Elizabeth to be raised as the future heir to the Russian throne. Catherine was alone once more. After her affair with Sergei, it was clear to Catherine that she could never return to her old celibate life. Consequently, one half of the road to temptation was already covered, and it's only human in such situations that one should not be left halfway. Catherine soon took another lover, Grigory Grigorievich Orlov. Dashing, dangerous and exciting, he was notorious for his wild lifestyle. Catherine could not resist him. She grew to enjoy the danger of their secret liaisons, even disguising herself and slipping past palace guards to make each secret rendezvous. When Catherine became pregnant again, even the feeble-minded Peter might have noticed, so she took steps to hide her condition. Her pregnancy was disguised under large hooped skirts. When she went into labor, one of her servants agreed to burn down his own house to distract Peter. Unable to resist a good fire, Peter rushed to watch the flames, leaving Catherine to have Orloff's child in privacy. In all, Catherine had three children by Orloff. Empress Elizabeth died in 1762, and Peter was proclaimed Tsar of all the Russias. Peter's sexuality awakened when he took a mistress and fell in love. He took steps to divorce Catherine and banish her to a convent. She had to take action. Aided by Catherine, Grigory Orloff and his brother Alexei fomented resistance to Tsar Peter. 
many army officers were only too willing to see the mad and inept ruler deposed. On the 28th of June, Catherine seized her chance. With her husband Tsar Peter away from St. Petersburg and the city empty of guards, Catherine urged her lover Olaf to take action. Willing to do anything for his beloved Catherine, within hours Olaf had his rebel forces marching to St. Petersburg. Before Peter even knew of the coup, Catherine had placed the imperial crown on her own head in Kazan Cathedral. The army acclaimed her as the new Russian ruler. As the news spread, more and more nobles rallied behind her. Peter III's short reign was over. The devoted Orlov took the former Tsar into custody, but he and his brother Alexei were restless guarding the prisoner they referred to as the monster. Alexei wrote to Catherine, Our monster has fallen very sick and has had an unexpected attack of colic. I'm afraid that he might die tonight and fear still more that he may live. The first fear I have because he chatters pure nonsense and that amuses us. And the second fear because he really is dangerous for all of us, often speaking as if he were still Tsar. Fortunately for the Orloff brothers, Tsar Peter recovered, but mysteriously their royal prisoner then fell ill once again, almost certainly due to poisoning. To be sure the former Tsar wouldn't recover, the Orloffs beat him to death. With Peter safely out of the way, Catherine showered her lover with titles and gave him vast estates. As Tsarina, Catherine now held immense power. But her lover Olaf, the man who engineered her rise, would not remain in her affections for long. His growing arrogance and lust for power were becoming excessive. As he became more demanding, Catherine began to lose interest and her attention turned elsewhere. Empowered by her freedom and position, Catherine the Great took on a series of lovers, all handsome, all young, and all soldiers. The desperate Orloff tried to regain his place in Catherine's affections by buying one of the most precious gifts in the world, the gem that would become known as the Orloff Diamond. This huge stone weighed nearly 200 carats and was said to have been the eye of an idol in a temple in India. Orloff, in an unashamed display of the wealth Catherine had showered on him, gave her the diamond. Catherine took the gift but refused to take him back as a lover. He had made an expensive mistake. Realizing he would never again be master of her heart, Orloff left Russia and married his cousin. Grigory Orloff died in 1783. In the end, he went insane, obsessed and haunted by the part he played in the murder of Tsar Peter. Catherine herself died on the 6th of November, 1796, aged 67. It was said by her enemies at the time that she died trying to make love to a horse whose harness broke, crushing the unfortunate Tsarina. The rumor has survived, but in fact all her lovers were human, and she died from a stroke here in the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. Catherine the Great used her passions to secure a throne. Queen Margot bedded any man she wanted. Both loved an army of unlucky men who unwittingly suffered the kiss of death. <laughs>